Hello. Hello this is Joanna. <laughs> uh, Hi, guys. Let me hand you that. that will Thank control. you. Hello. I've been patiently waiting behind that curtain. Like, is it time? Should I go now? Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Joanna Lord. I'm the VP of Marketing at a company called Porch. How many of you have heard of Porch? A couple of people. Know what? These are my people. Excellent. It's working. Um, yeah, I'm super excited to be here. I was fortunate enough to get introduced to Mitch through a mutual friend. And he stopped by the Porch office, and we started chatting. And you just never know, you know when someone sits down if you're going to connect. And we just started geeking out over everything on demand, everything local, everything marketplace. Um, and we found ourselves talking for quite some time. When I heard he was bringing a number of people together for a day in San Francisco to talk about this, I was fascinated because right now at Porch, this is what I'm living and breathing. Literally every day, it's a new challenge as we think about trying to stand up a healthy marketplace and as we try to think about how we're going to enter and, and what parts of our business are going to be in the local side of things. Um, so that's what I'm going to kind of talk about a little bit today. Um, there are a lot of challenges. I think I looked at the agenda and I kind of saw who's speaking, and I think we're going to go deep on a lot of it. What I want to start with this morning is some of the changes I'm seeing, some of the significant shifts in the way that I used to do marketing or the way that I used to try to reach consumers or the behaviors they have, and try to set the tone for some of those topics later today. So let's see if this works. So for those that don't know much about Porch, seems like most of you do. We can always talk about it later today. Um, it's been an exciting ride. We're a young company, and the parts that we've been able to activate in our marketplace were, were very intentional, and it's actually already starting to talk through some of the stuff we heard earlier today around the systems we put in place, the operational excellence we invested in early, the way we're accessing data, the way we're making data accessible to partners. A lot of that is what we spent time on early. We also spent a ton of time standing up that supply side and getting a really healthy pro network in place. Um, so again, we can talk more about that later today if anyone wants to know about Porch, but you'll see that theme you know, occur again and again as I talk through some of the shifts we've seen. Um, it's uniquely advantageous to invest in that side of the market early, um, and I'll talk through some of that. So you know, what, what is load? I like that we're making it a term. I like that we're going all in on a new word. Um, you know, when I, it's load, oh wow, and the puns have begun. Is it too early for some puns? Um, is it ever too early for puns? So when we think about load, there's a lot of definitions, right? We, can, we, we know the concept of Uber, uberfication of services. And I think that it's a strong enough analogy now that we can, we can say that and know what it means. When I look at the more traditional definitions of an on-demand economy, there's some parts that stick out to me that I think are specifically relevant, which is this concept of economic activity. So the activity in which we are exchanging has significantly changed, which has changed the way that consumers want to give and get. Um, and whether or not they're participating in a specific on-demand economy right now, it, that is not going to change. It is going to change the way that they want to get things and the way that they want to give things. It's the, the natural evolution of the sharing economy, and we all saw this coming. Um, the second part is really around the technology piece, which is this layer of systems, um, this layer of logistics, and whether or not it's in place and it's tapped in well, as we just heard, to your CRM and to your other systems that you've already invested in. And how accessible is it by all of the teams across the company? And how can they use all the data that you're collecting to do their jobs better? And so these two are combining to create a really interesting opportunity for a lot of the companies in the room. Um, you know, the immediate provisioning of goods and services, well, we knew we were going there. Everyone wants things now. We saw that. Um, but did we know that it would be received as well and that people would absorb this type of living as fast? I don't know if we could have predicted that. Um, we will see this only accelerate in the next two years. And that will be the more significant shift, is how quickly it's being adopted, um, and not just by urban dwellers, but how quickly it expands. Um, and we'll talk some more about that as well. To me, it is a paradigm shift. There were assumptions I made about my consumers 13 years ago when I started marketing that I, don't, I, I can't even count on anymore. There were assumptions in the funnel. There were assumptions in the discovery phase. There were assumptions in the way I retained or I built loyalty that no longer exist. And that is what has made it an actual paradigm shift. Um, we have a number of people right now in jobs like me or in jobs in other teams doing what they've always done on a completely different consumer. And it's not just the age they are, it's the way that they behave and it's the way that they consume and the way that they exchange. And so when you get that sort of mix, things get pretty crazy. Um, we're going to have some people that do it really well because they adapt really quickly and they start to learn what's different. And we're going to have others that try to force it, and it's not going to work. And those companies will have great ideas, and they'll have uh, you know, great companies and teams behind them, but they won't adopt the new technologies, and they won't adapt fast enough. So this is the paradigm shift that we're seeing. 
You know, when I, when I think about what's changed, there are, there, are, there are things that resonate time and time again. Um, the number one thing for me is just the search and find, and Mitch just talked about this. The funnel is so different now. Um, I used to spend so much of my budget and so many hours of my team's time focused on how I can show up in search and how I can be every place that they might possibly go search and that I can look best and that time and time again my touch points were consistent, effective, educational, informative, valid, they were trusted. All of these words are what I went after with my campaigns. And same with the find. I was focused on the comparison phase. I was focused on when they did go searching and they got all the information, was I the clear winner? And that was where I spent most of my time, the top of the funnel, the awareness side. And now we're starting to see this get mentality. Get it for me, know for me, know ahead of me, know where I'm gonna be, what I'm gonna need, and make sure that it's accessible and it's easy and it's beautiful. And so I'm playing in the middle of the funnel. I'm playing deeper down the funnel. I'm playing in retention and K factor and virality. Every person is two people, is four people, is eight people. And that's where I spend all of my time now and more of my budget and more of my team's time and who I'm hiring in for and the systems I buy into. And so that's actually just, a, that's a huge change. That's a complete reframe of the hours I spend in my day. This is a great quote by Ev Williams, which is this, the concept of the internet makes human desires more easily attainable. In other words, it offers convenience. Convenience on the internet is basically achieved by two things, speed and cognitive ease. Um, if you study what the really big things on the internet are, you realize they're masters at making things fast and not making people think. And I think a lot, especially in the phrase itself, on demand, we think of the ease, convenience, a lot, and it's super important. The flexibility of that is, is really revolutionary. But the truth is, it's the ease of thinking. It's not making them think. It's the intuitive feeling that they just kind of get you and then they know your living habits and now it's going to be available and you're going to participate in this and it's not going to cost you a lot of brain power. That is what every consumer is waking up and wanting from the people in this room. Um, and that's pretty different. And that is what I now have to market through and to and around, which is pretty different. Um, the noise, they are almost going to be able to shut off to the noise of a lot of the marketing I've put in, in, in place traditionally um, because they don't need it. They, you know, the, the, they figured those people don't get them. And so I need to earn the right to be part of their everyday habits. Um, and we'll talk about that, but I, I think it's significant. The second one is really around connection. I'm particularly passionate about this because I, I love the concept of community. I love the concept of like two people connecting over an idea, us in this room. Um, I'm a big hugger. I hug a lot of people. I love connection. And when I think about how connection has changed, it is probably one of the most significant um, shifts I've seen in how people want to be treated which means what a connection was five years ago is very different now. If you, if you connected with someone over an exchange of goods or services one time a year, it was a connection, right? Because we did that. We went offline, I gave you something, you gave me something, or we were online and we connected once on Twitter, we connected once via an email, that was a connection. It's no longer a connection unless it happens more often, happens you know, more frequently, it's more delightful. The expectation of a true connection has increased. Um, and I like that, I like that a lot. Uh, the frequency, proximity, and simplicity are going to be the three arenas in which connection will significantly change. And the on-demand economy is either going to tap into this or they're going to miss it, which is this idea, I expect when I really connect with someone that I see them more often or they serve me more often or I get value from them more often. I expect that to be closer. I don't want to go further. I don't want to drive far for it. I don't want to have to work for it. I want things to be on my way home. I want them to be already in my existing daily patterns. And this idea of simplicity, I want it to be easy. In the past, if I was connecting with someone and it was exhausting, but I got the value out of the exchange I wanted, that was okay. We still connected and, and something was taken care of. That's no longer the case. That's a recipe for a one-time connection, not an ongoing connection. And so they expect that everything be beautiful and easy and accessible and shareable. And so when you think about that in itself, when I talk about the fact that most of my life is spent on increasing the number of touch points and deepening those touch points so that no one goes anywhere but the brand I work for, then connection is really at the heart of that and so much has changed. The third one is really this concept of being relied on. Um, this goes back to the responsibility of all of us now that we are in their homes and in their lives. And I take that really seriously. Um, I love my home. I work for a company that is all about helping you love your home. This is why I went to go work at Porch. I think it's a really personal space. I think our moments are made in our homes. And the fact that we're letting people in 
or that we're letting them drop things off that become part of our nightly routines or our morning routines or our weekend routines or our once a month routines is a personal, personal thing. And it's the responsibility of us to be respectful of that. Um, Seth kind of touches on this in his, in his world of permission marketing, which at this point is many years old now. This was where it was going, which is this idea that they can shut us off at any time. And it, it's so much harder to work our way in. And once we're in their lives, all it takes is the swipe of a button to be like, I never want to see or hear from them again. Or you know, the, the close out of an app that I'm never going to download again. It is, it is such a personal exchange that when, when we are not righted, you know, when we are wronged, uh, it's so much easier and so much more concrete to say no. The best consumers will ignore us. And we're all after the best consumers. There will be transient consumers in this market, ones that kind of always test different apps or they're always testing ways to make their lives more convenient. Those won't be the ones that bring in or, or create the network effect, for, uh, network effect for you. They won't be the ones that you build your entire community or audiences on. You want the best consumers, the ones that are going to be ambassadors of whatever you're selling or doing for them, of the experiences that they're having. They're the ones that are going to build it for you. So I'm after the best consumers, and, and I have this responsibility to earn their respect and treat them the way they deserve. And I think that we need to think about this, that local on-demand economy is all about them relying on us. And if we, if we fall short, it's going to be really hard to get back that loyalty. Uh, we might not get a second chance, because it's that personal of an exchange. Um, the third one, I'm really bad at these. I'm kind of like infamously bad at these. <laughs> I'm going, forget it. Um, so the fourth one is the system sophistication. We heard a little bit about this this morning. I think you're going to hear about it all day. Um, and it's the idea that we have to operationally invest in standing up not just healthy marketplaces, but all of the systems around them that make those marketplaces accessible by all of our teams, the data exchangeable across those teams, so that we can then deliver the best experiences in the best ways and market and educate and inform and communicate transactionally or otherwise in the best ways. And so that means that everyone in the room is going to have to be an operator. Um, you're going to, I think there's, a, there's an investment panel later, and I'm pretty sure this will probably get talked about then, which is this idea that you're seeing some of the local on-demand companies really just kill it and crush it. Some of them are just taking off. And if you look at it, they have some really talented operators in their teams. They also have an operational background. And so they're thinking of this not just as a great idea that serves a great market with huge opportunity and upside, um, but they're thinking about it as how do we invest early to set in place a system that will accelerate our growth as we move forward. Um, and that, that is really intelligent. Uh, you know, the best brands in the world, independent of load, are operationalizing at every turn. And, and that is an expectation now. Some companies are not. They're thinking, I'll grow into that as, our, as, as we gain you know, momentum or we get some traction. We'll invest in that system later. We'll understand how we'll connect those later. We'll do all this stuff offline. Uh, we'll get this you know, into some docs over here, and it won't be accepted. That is a recipe for disaster, especially for this kind of economy and what's expected of these types of companies. Um, the data begets the product. We think of data as an output of a great product that we then take and use, and we do better marketing. We do better product development. Um, it's the opposite in, in the on-demand economy. It's the concept that if you, you, you put the data of your consumer at the heart of things, you will then create the best product, will then get you the best data. And so you need to shift that. It's a reframe of how we think. Uh, Porch is exceptionally well operationalizing things. I used to think I was a good operator until I came to this company. <laughs> And now I am by far just learning. I'm just in it, like every day, fascinated by some of the, the operators we have at the company that are thinking systematically on every choice we make. You know, when we think of our offline experience for our booking business, I'm thinking about the delight in the kind of um, the, the moments of unscalable delight, the leave behinds, the touch points, and all the things I can try to do. And they are thinking systematically about that. OK, well, how can we turn that into something we can invest in that will turn into something more, that will turn into something more? How can we leverage our network better to do that for us? How can we then get UGC captured when the pro enters the home? And how can we feed that over? And I'm just like, whoa, like that's crazy. But it creates the flywheel. We call it extending our moat. And so when you get the data in early and when you use it really well, that's going to separate the big winners in this market from those that just do pretty well. Um, the last one is really this concept around feedback is your roadmap. Again, it used to be an output, and especially as a marketer, I used to use feedback as an after, an after effect, a way to measure a campaign. Did it go well? 
as I get that feedback, maybe I put a little bit of it into my marketing, but really it was more of a reactive touch point for me. It's the opposite now. Um, on the on-demand economy, sharing is part of checkout most of the time. We're hearing their words as they're ending the process, right? As they're getting the things, as they're ending the ride, as they're getting, you know, getting the massage at home. It is, it is part of the next interaction with that brand as well. It is in it. It is the lifeblood of all of the experiences. And it's gonna be really hard if you don't turn feedback loops into systematic processes for your company. If you don't build in those feedback loops so that every time someone gives you a piece of feedback, you are understanding it, summarizing it, sharing it across team, revisiting it often, measuring it for sentiment, measuring it for impact, thinking about how you're gonna build into it. If you're not doing that on an ongoing basis and your competitors are, it's a huge disadvantage. So you really need to think of scalable feedback loops, and that goes back to the systems as well. If one of your teams is receiving a ton of feedback, or maybe it's coming through social platforms, but it's not immediately directly impacting the way you're treating your, your supply side, that's gonna be huge. Your demand isn't happy, but you didn't get it over to your supply side, and they're already going through it, and they're not, they're not reacting or getting better. And so we need to be thinking like that all the time. The age of the consumer power demands a significant reframe. Um, we knew the consumers were gaining power. We know they were getting access to more information than ever before. The democratization of content alone has made it great for consumers to self-educate and decide faster on a more informed way than ever before. And now they just expect more of us and they expect better experiences. I personally am very excited about this. I think one of the biggest reframes will be that I and most of us in the room will live and die based on the experiences we provide. And that means I get to start marketing experiences and not products and services. And I'm jazzed about that. Like I would so much rather spend my day thinking about how my brand is delivering a truly valuable special experience and then put that at the heart of my marketing than think about our feature differentiation. Or think about you know, our UV, like UVP models and like do, do they, is our competitor better over here? Is our competitor better over there? It's like who cares? Is our experience special? Do they want to do it all the time? And that feeds right in to the, this, this load mentality, which is, do I earn the right to be a part of every one of their days? And so this is what I'm excited about. I think this is when magic really starts to happen. It's why we've seen some of the companies take off, the Munchries, the Ubers. Part of their experiences are incredibly delightful. Um, and they're braggable. And I think that braggability is a real factor in today's economy. Um, and that, that excites me as a marketer. What will that require from all of us? I, you know, I don't know how many of you self-identify as marketers, um, but you know, I think all of us, no matter what our role is at the companies that we, that we partake in or our own companies, um, we, we now have to best position ourselves, best explain ourselves, and, and best deliver value, right? And those are all true things to marketing. And I think that now we're going to be expected to do it better. And I use that like as the most obvious term. Like, we don't get to sail through anymore. We don't get to like do part of it poorly, but do part of it well. Good luck to that guy. Like no one's making it in that world. And I think that's good. That's why we're seeing such a difference between slow momentum gainers and just racehorses that are killing it. Um, and so let's talk through, I wanna talk through a little bit what better marketing means to me. Loyalty is now part of everyone's job. So I definitely, at least you know, 10 years ago, if you'd said to me, you know, what's your role? My job was to acquire. I was a paid marketer. I was an analytical marketer. I worked in PPC, SEM display. I was, I was all about getting them in. And then when they converted, I threw them over a fence and like someone else needed to make sure they stuck around. And now that is no longer the case. I'm expected to have them fall in love with us. You know, Matt, my CEO, tells me all the time, do more people love us today than yesterday? Because that's, to him, my job. And I'm like, yeah, Matt, they do. They do, I think so. I counted them, they love us. Um, you know, you're trying and you lose some people because you, you didn't serve them the best way and then you gotta like win them back in an authentic way, full of integrity and there's just, it's better. Um, loyalty is challenging. There's traditionally four types of loyalty and I think it's worth kind of going through. Um, this is what most of us operate under, this concept of no loyalty. About 5% of all your audiences are just always gonna be transient in nature. Um, okay, there's the inertial loyalty which is going to be entirely disrupted by load. Inertial loyalty is the idea that on my way home, I always get that brand of milk because that brand of milk is always at that store and that store is near my home. Totally disrupted. This was a huge part of most small businesses and local businesses plan. This was what their business was built on, the foundation. And now, 
many of you in the room are completely disrupting that, or you're supporting it, depending on how, you're, how, how it's set up, right? Um, so inertial loyalty is very interesting. That's going to shift significantly. There's latent loyalty, this idea that you make one or two big purchases in a year, and every time you do, you go to the same company. Um, that you know, could be the future disrupted segment of loyalty and the concept that once, they, once all of these companies get into our lives, do they find ways to then get in, they are the brands of choice that they then inform us on where to go for these bigger purchase moments or these, these bigger lifestyle choices? That's very possible. Um, and then premium loyalty. This is what everyone was after for the last de you know, couple decades. They wanted to be the choice every time you, need, you made it, and then they wanted to be bragged about when the choice was made. This is Apple at its finest, right? You can't buy an Apple product if you're an Apple lover and not tell the world you just bought an Apple product. It is literally addictive. <laughs> like, you have to share it. Um, so everyone was after premium loyalty. And, you know, to the last couple of years, this was the standard they were going after. There is a fifth type of loyalty that has emerged in the last couple of years. Um, I worked at a loyalty platform company prior to Porch, and so I spent two or three years going really, like, deep prior as I went into that company, and, as, and even since I've left that company, thinking about this fifth type of loyalty, which is the exchange. It's the idea that a brand needs to give loyalty to a consumer prior to getting loyalty from them. And so all four previously were about getting loyalty, and this one is about giving before you get. And that's at the heart of the load world, right? What are you giving them experience-wise, preemptively, value, education, delight, ease, convenience? What are you giving them before you expect anything from them? The companies that win a reciprocal loyalty will win this market. They will absolutely win this market because it's a braggable exchange, and it is even, right? In the sense, it's very meta because it's a healthy marketplace in itself. And so if you think of it in this way, what are you doing to build this in? This takes upfront costs. It takes top-down buy-in. It takes a lot to systematically bring this through your company. Um, and, it, and it's different. Munchery does this exceptionally well. Something as simple as the cookie they give you the first time you order, the handwritten note, the way they remind us that they are focused on donating meals, right? The way that they're always reminding us how many meals we've helped them donate. This is them giving before they're getting, and we love them for it. Uh, so thinking that through. The second one is using your access for good. So being a search marketer by trade, I've spent a lot of years knowing that Google's evil, right? <laughs> Google's telling me not to be evil, and I'm like, you're all evil. And there's this idea of like, don't use, yeah, you're all evil. But like, don't use the access you have to data, knowledge, and consumer insights for bad. In the local on-demand economy, you cannot use your access for bad. And in fact, the companies that actually think to themselves, now that I'm in your home and I'm in your life and I'm in your day, how am I going to use this for good? They're the ones that are going to win. And I intentionally chose this brand to be a little controversial here. We know they get a lot of slack. We know they have a reputation problem. They have challenges. They've made a lot of mistakes. They've also done a lot of great cause marketing. They've done a lot of good in the world. And it's kind of hard to ignore that. If you look at Uber Slay, it was their first effort a couple years ago. They wanted to, they had a goal of like 10,000 toys donated to kids around the holidays. 60,000 toys were donated through their service because they had access, because they built it for good. Their efforts with Tom's was also genius. Their work with MAD is really smart. They have access to college students that could make bad choices at the end of the night, and they've chosen to use that access for good and to rethink their pricing model and rethink their margins and their lifetime value of those customers for something better. That's good stuff. That's why they're winning. Um, and we need to push ourselves to think that way. That's not a campaign you do. That's a philosophy we, we incorporate into our business. This, this next one is the voice of the customer content at the heart of everything. Um, I'm a storyteller. Mitch and I kind of geeked out over this. He's certainly a storyteller. You know, I think that the, the brands that are doing the best out there today aren't just telling great stories, they're finding the way that their customers and their audiences have great stories and they're sharing them on their behalf. I've been saying for years, like, I am jazzed because I can just get out of the way now. Like, I used to market for someone, like, what's special about you? Great, I'm going to take it, I'm going to coordinate it, I'm going to package it, I'm going to share it, I'm going to come back and tell you that I shared it, and then you're going to go share that I shared it. And now it's just like, oh, that's awesome, you're doing that, I'm going to help you amplify it and I'm going to get out of the way. And that is what better marketing is all about these days. Um, some companies in the on-demand economy are doing this really well. You have two audiences. We have marketplaces full of stories. Um, at Porch, we have these homeowners 
that love their home and they're building rooms for transitional times in their life like kids going off to college and it's time for me to get the, the gardening room I always wanted or the crafts room or we have homes where you know, you're trying to build something because this is your first time you've ever been able to buy your first home. These are stories that I want to share to the world, not to exploit them, but because they're beautiful and other people share those stories. And on the pro side, we spend a lot of time telling the stories of our pros. They're third and fourth generation professionals. My brother-in-law is a professional. He built a life for my sister and, and my nephews through his work. You know, Those are stories that they can share. I would much rather spend my time marketing that to the world than marketing Porch, the marketplace. Um, Stylisted does this very well. Uh, the stories of their makeup artists telling not just, you know, what can you get from them and what's the pricing of the different makeup hour by hour. It's like, what, why did they get into makeup? What else do they do outside of this? You know, like, is the, are they artists? Are they creatives? Um, you know, are they fashion lovers? And I think that they, they tell these stories really well to the point that you're invested in this marketplace. Even if you don't use them all the time, you tell people about it because you're like, oh my gosh, I, I read this great story. Like she got into it because her mom was like, you know, this famous actress and like she loved makeup and you know, just beautiful stories. So I encourage you to go read it. They also put it at the heart of their community. Getting your supply side on your community uh, platforms and showing their stories and showing their smiles and their faces and their life is really critical for this because we need to know who's coming into our life. Um, so great stuff there. This one is, is, is been talked a little bit about, but it's the idea that we could spend all our time focused on the demand, and we could spend all our time focused on the shift in consumer behavior and how to reach consumers and how to serve consumers, and that is a valid effort, um, valiant effort. We also need to remember the supply side. Uh, Porch was built on our pro network. We are, we are gonna make it or we are not gonna make it based on our pro network. Um, and we talk a lot about that. There are putting pros in a better place. Walk in every day. Are you putting a pro in a better place? Um, and our investment with Lowe's, our partnership with them was all around strengthening the pro network. And now it's time to make sure we give back, to make sure they have everything they need from us, to make sure that just because now we're really focused on also the consumer side and standing up that side of the marketplace, that we don't forget they're the reason we get to be here. And so Postmates does a great job of this. These are real people. They're like, this is a lifestyle they've tapped into. Um, and when they have get-togethers, it's not contrived. It's not like, oh, come be a part of a Postmate gathering. It's like, oh, there's a bunch of Postmates over there. Like, you guys should meet up. Like, it's facilitating a true lifestyle of the supply side, and this is really important. We need to be serving our supply. This is critical. When we think about tools, are you giving them the tools to educate, to connect with each other, to learn how to do it better, not just for you, but for them, because this is now their jobs or part-time jobs. This could become their livelihood, their only job. Um, so now we have, we have the expectation put on us to help them with tools. On the support side, are you giving as much support to them as you are your consumer? Are you standing up local Twitter handles? Are you standing up local events? Are you standing up FAQs and community-oriented educational, to, you know, all of that to support them so that they feel as, as appreciated as your consumers? Um, again, just Facebook and Instagram and making sure you bring them to life. They've got stories to tell too. They have expectations. They want to complain if things go wrong too, and they should get to as loud and as vocally as they wish, and then we will respond accordingly. Um, and then the idea of payments, this is gonna be critical. We are at the point now that if you don't own the payment in some capacity, and if you don't make the payments easier for your supply side, you will not win. Um, I put up the payability logo up there. They're out of New York. They're, they're disrupting the space in this way. Um, they're making it easy to accelerate payments to your supply side. That is where your suppliers, your drivers, your makeup artists, your massage therapists, they're gonna go to the marketplace that pays them the fastest and most conveniently for them. And if you don't hold on to that supply side, you can't win. And so thinking about all of this and making sure it's at the heart of every meeting you're in is really important. This last one, don't do it if it won't delight them. You know, this is, this, we're in the era of delight. That word, that word, it's like gross to me. I loved it, and then it got like all convoluted, and everyone uses it, and now I don't know what it means. Um, but I do, do, I do believe that delighting them will be more important than delivering to them. Zeal does a great job. They're a massage on demand. Not sure if you guys are familiar with them, some of you maybe. Uh, it's not just about the massage, right? If you're a zealot, you also can get a robe, you can get champagne delivered. They tapped into what that experience, what the best of that experience was prior to on-demand economies, they brought into the on-demand economy. I mean, the whole point of massage was that I could like feel like a queen or a king. And they brought that in and they made it on demand. Like, yeah, I want to feel like a queen on demand. That sounds great. 
Um, and so thinking about the personal touches and the notes and then sharing those stories. And this is what I mean when I say delight. It's not about fulfillment. It's about being fulfilled. And I think we need to keep that perspective. You can be logistically sound, nail the last mile, have the operations that are beautiful, the systems that can win. That's all great. If they don't feel fuller, richer, satisfied, and delighted, they will not come back. You will not earn the right to be a part of their life. I put up these pictures. These are all pictures from our porch world because that's what we're after. Like, I'm not after helping you build a room faster or get a, get a sink fixed faster. I'm helping you sleep in and cuddle with your child. Like, I think that every day. That's, that's why I wake up early. That's why I don't sleep anymore. Um, and, and so that's real. And if you believe that to be truly real, you will build your products differently. You will stand up your communities differently. You will price things differently. You will give back before you get. It's a philosophy and a reframe. 89% of consumers have stopped after a bad experience. We know that. That's where I used to live, the reactive world. Why did you stop? Come back, win back, win back, come back. We're nice now. I'm sorry I did that. I didn't know you would find out. That used to be. I mean, right? It's like, it's crappy, it's bad. Um, this is where I play now. 55% of consumers will pay more if it's a great experience. I'm all about that. I'm finding the great consumers and I'm over delivering. That's what I want to do. That's where I would rather spend my time. Great, great LTVs, great margins, good business, I know. But it's also awesome and fun and people love it. And so that's great. And all of that story then I take and build into my marketing. So this is the arena that we play in now. The winners and on demand are playing in this arena. Um, so what we need to realize is they want things now. They expect you to know what they want how they want it, when they want it, they expect you to know that. It needs to be systematically accessible to all your teams so they can tap into that knowledge. And they want it done beautifully. Ease, UX, UI, design, um, touch points, right, follow-ups. Um, and if you earn it and you delight them, they will mark it on your behalf. Uh, we are in the world of you know, word of mouth marketing. I can only control so much anymore, and that's okay. If we do it right, it will be okay. And we'll, we'll win through this. It's not a trend, it's a paradigm shift. Everyone in this room certainly believes that, or you wouldn't have come for this entire day. You guys are early adopters to this world. You are going to be the people talking about this as other people are like, whoa, that whole thing happened and everything changed. You're like, yeah, told you, years ago, hello. Um, so it's a shift. The best companies either adapt or they don't. And that's why I talk about brand all year, all around the world, I love it. The best brands are adapting significantly, even some of the top, but most of the best brands did not adapt fast enough and they're no longer at the top. And so we need to look at this. It's, you know, adapt or die mentality. And this last quote by Josh Elman at Greylock, which is, I feel like so many existing experiences can be reinvented with the right simple gestures on mobile. And the needs and wants of generation touch are going to become the foundation of massive companies. The needs and the wants of a new world like, this is all different, right? This, this validates us being in a room talking about this all day because so much has changed so quickly and been adopted. Um, the existing experiences will be reinvented. And I think that's really exciting. This isn't, you know, evolution. It's revolution. Truly, that's where we're at. Um, and I'm excited to hear from all of you today. I'll be around if anyone wants to chat more. I think we're at time, but, but thank you very much for this. Thank you, Joanne.